What's going on, everyone? And welcome back to the Midwest Outdoors podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jim O'Neill, and we are brought to you by Fish Daddy. If you guys have never checked out Fish Daddy baits, you need to now. Whether it's ice or open water, from panfish to bass or walleye, Fish Daddy has just about everything you need to catch your PB. So check it out, fishdaddyoutdoors.com, and get yourself some baits today. Now, we got a full show for you guys, and I can't wait to get into it. We have truly a dear friend and someone who helped me start in this industry, Dale Bowman. He is a columnist and writer for the Sun-Times, uh, Chicago paper, and we get to talk to him about what's new in Chicago, what's been going on, and some of the changes that he's seen over the past almost 30 years now of working in the industry. Then our main interview, we have Terry Adams, and we sit down and talk to him about the tear he has been on for the last three years. That's right, Terry resides down on Kentucky Lake, and whether it's Kentucky Lake, Lake Barkley, or some of the rest of the TVA, He's been smashing crappie, and he has the hardware to prove it. So we're going to talk to him and talk about how to catch summer crappie and how to locate them and how to put more fish in your cooler this year. Before we get into all of that, as always, we're going to start with the news. And we had some big things this week, so let's get into it. First of all, I want to take a shout out for one of my other podcasters, all right? An awesome podcast out there, Tackle Talk Podcast. Um, I was just listening and saw a graphic that they posted that 57 million people in 2023 fished in the U.S. And, you know, when you talk about 57 million people, whether it's once or a bunch, that is a large percentage of how many Americans we even have. And some of those are visitors from other countries and such, but it shows how big of an industry this is. It shows how impactful it is and how it's part of who we are as humans, you know, hunters and gatherers. And I think fishing is one of the easiest ways to get into that and most enjoyable. So to everyone who went fishing last year and is going fishing this year, thanks, because things like this, the show, um, you know, Fish Daddy Baits, so on and so forth, it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the interest of the viewers and all the other fishermen out there and outdoorsmen. So thank you, and we hope you continue fishing, and we hope next year that number's over 60 million. And then I think we'd solve some world problems, because if you fish more, there's less problems. Minnesota actually came out with nine new state records since they changed their records um, in March, what they did was they opened up more categories. They added a few subspecies to the list that are their own, and they added more fish to the catch and release category. So that opened a lot more opportunities to have a state record. So what I'm saying pretty much is, if you're in the Midwest and you wanna to try to have a state record, maybe Minnesota's a good place to start right now. But anywhere from shovel nose um, to smallmouth bass, and including the most recent, a three pound, nine ounce black crappie. And not only did I say, wow, that's an amazing looking fish, but I said that name sounds familiar. Noah Sprengler, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong, but he already holds the Minnesota Muskie state record and now has the black crappie state record. Proof that if you spend more time than most on the water, perfecting your craft and just taking more casts, you have a better chance to catch one. So Noah, we see you. And I'd love to have you on the show sometime and talk about those hunts and know if you were targeting them or how they came about. But nonetheless, to have two state records and fish of that quality are incredible. Now, to the tournament rundown, we, do, we did have a couple big events finish. Um, last show, we talked about how we were kicking off the MLF and Bassmaster event. Both of those saw a winner and, you know, we had an older face and a newer face. Um, MLF, the winner, Skeet Reese. That's right, the boy in yellow, um, the California kid. Not, lo- not a kid anymore, but I think so many people have been focused on how forward-facing sonar and the youth have been taking over. But this event was on the St. James River in Virginia, and it's a tidal fishery. Now, if you guys don't know anything about tidal fisheries or don't know a whole lot about them, Um, neither do I. (laughs) Here in the Midwest, it's not a super prevalent thing. Now, 
I have fished slight tidal changes on a lake that was connected to Lake Michigan before. It's a different concept. You know, again, moves with the moon phase a little bit. And um, it's just, it's just really interesting, especially when you talk about these coastal tidal bodies of water. The tide can change by multiple feet at a time. We watch anglers get stuck. We watch some have to claw and pull and pull their way out of backwaters under bridges. I mean, it was quite a spectacle, but hey, Skeet, congrats to you. You deserve it. It's great to see a legend win another one. Now, very different fishing down in Alabama. Bassmasters were fishing on Smith Lake and Taku Ito, one of my favorite anglers, took home the win on a strong charging last day. And when you catch a six pound spot almost on a dice, it's, uh, it makes it good TV. And yeah, that, that is what separates Taku and some of these other Japanese fishermen is they're fishing with techniques that we're not really used to, some we've never seen before, or some are just a little too odd for us to wrap our brains around and fish. So he won fishing by drop shotting a dice, literally a, a sided dice that has little hairs coming out of it, like silicone um, skirt-like material, right? And a lot of people are caught up on how this isn't real fishing or that it doesn't look like something, but obviously it does, you know? Um, I had a great time watching Mike Iaconelli spin out a little bit on how people are winning tournaments on dice, and he's like, listen, if this is what the world's coming to, I don't wanna do it. First of all, I don't believe him. He will be throwing dice at some point if they keep winning tournaments. But secondly, I get it, you know? We are in a different world of fishing now. We have forward-facing sonar, we have giant glide baits and swim baits, we have micro finesse minnows and dice cubes coming out of Japan. And not to mention the fact that Taku had a powder that he was caking all his baits in. Something interesting to see for sure. And it just proves that sometimes you gotta think a little outside the box. Speaking of outside the box, we're now going to join Dale Bowman and talk about the oddities that have been happening on the Chicago lakefront and the changes he's seen over the past 30 years of his career writing outdoor and fishing columns for the paper here in Chicago. Now, before I bring him in, I do want to say this. Dale was one of the most influential people in my youth. Um, I truly believe a lot of the reason maybe why I'm here doing this today. Uh, you know, I was a kid that was obsessed with fishing and I wanted to broadcast it to as many people as possible. And it was still on the early days of social media. You know, it was really barely kicking off. We had Facebook and Dale put my words and my pictures and my passion to life in the paper. And it got me some of my first sponsors and some of my first recognitions. So I'll always be, I'll truly always be grateful for Dale and, um, this is a major story of my life. And there's a binder at home in my basement labeled Dale Bowman with articles about this much. So Dale, truly from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for all you've done for the industry, especially in Chicago and what you've done for me. So without further ado, let's bring him on, Dale Bowman. All right, everyone, we are now joined by Dale Bowman. And like I said in the intro, um, I don't know if I'd be here doing what I do today without Dale. Um, definitely, definitely a piece of the South Side of Chicago and this Jimmy O'Neill story. Dale, how are you today? I'm all right. I should have heard your intro though. Maybe I would have been overwhelmed. But... You'll you'll hear it when this comes out. Okay. You'll hear it when it comes out. Um, but no, you know, I, I was telling people a little bit that you've you're, you know, you're the columnist for the outdoors in the Chicago paper. And I mean, how long have you been doing it? Give us a little background on that real quick. I think it's the, in the 29th year, I think. I got to double check it. Uh, it's either 28th or 29th, but uh, I valued every year. I, I It's been a, and speaking of tech things, Jim and I were talking tech while we were trying to set up here. When I started, it was back in the days where I remember about a half a year or a year in, my wife said, you should get an email 
And I said, what the hell for? She goes, so people can get a hold of you. And I go, why? And, and you know, but I did. And then uh, for a while, you know, I was doing everything by phone and that was just the time. And now it's not even email as much as, you know, uh, messaging on social media. So it, there's been a lot of change, not to mention the changes that's happened in the natural world. So. Absolutely. We are in an ever changing world, whether uh, it, it seems like the tech moves faster and faster, you know, um, but yeah, the world itself changes. And uh, that's why that's why I wanted to give you a call this week, Dale, because over the last truly, it seems like two, three years, I've really seen a change in the Chicago land lakefront, Lake Michigan lakefront. Um, whether it's musky showing up in harbors, the amount of pike that are in some are doubling, um, more largemouth that are residential in the harbors, even to some of the more oddities like larger eel pout being caught in Indiana when it gets a little cooler, to now I saw a big old dinosaur on your page this morning that washed up. Yeah, it's that's now sturgeon pop up sporadically. Um, you know, they have this. It, Occasionally, some big ones in the southern end of the lake, but uh, and that was a big one. I mean, it was a five footer. That's that's a pretty good fish. Yeah, uh, it's but that's sturgeon are, are kind of the, our monster of the lake. I mean, that's they're rare and they when they pop up, they're noticeable. Or if somebody sees them, you know, if somebody sees one, you don't miss that. I mean, there aren't there aren't any, aren't any other four or five foot fish swimming in Lake Michigan. Well, I shouldn't. There probably is, but uh, mm -hmm. some of them, there's some of the big cats that might be in that range. But, sure. uh, yeah, absolutely. My first, my first story I ever heard of um, a sturgeon in Lake Michigan was I, I was a little bit younger and um, I was going down to the local tackle shop, Fishing Connection in Tinley Park, Illinois. And Greg over there, the owner, you know, he, he told me that one night they're out at night. It was pitch black, and um, he said all of a sudden the 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 fish finder showed a scan that was coming up and he said that can't be right because it took over almost the whole screen on the fish finder and they said they were in shallow enough water that they they wanted to see if something was truly floating under the boat and they took out a flashlight and they saw what they believe was a few feet left of a sturgeon going under the boat oh it was still alive mm -hmm. oh that's a great story I'll, if i get in there i'll have to ask him about that yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't remember exactly if it was if it was him or his friend that saw the fish, you know, but um, there was a, it was an eye account of a live sturgeon. And you you really never hear of them being caught. I mean, have you, you like you said, almost 30 years now, have you ever heard of one caught on the lakefront or in Lake Michigan? Three, three years ago, a guy caught one at Montrose and he put really? it back. He, he was smart enough to know that it's endangered. So he didn't go lugging it around and stuff. Uh then he released it right away, but he got photos and stuff like that. So that's fast. Um, and and the other one that uh, most famously sticks with me is uh, it was 22 years ago in Wolf Lake, a guy caught a 40 incher, hmm. and that one was tagged. And this was back, speaking of tech, where I actually had to call the biologist in Wisconsin. And he had to go through, it wasn't like he could jump online and, and just check, you know, see sure. what the number was. He had to go through paperwork and took him a day or two to get back to me and tell me where it was found. It was originally tagged way up the Wolf River. And so they're assuming, now they're assuming that it came down through, ended up in Green Bay and came down through. Uh, I mean, the other option obviously is that somebody caught it in Michigan or in uh, Wisconsin, brought it home and thought, why don't I put it in uh, Wolf Lake? And so, but it, it was cool that it was tagged, you know? So yeah. Super cool. It was tagged. I mean, that adds a lot to the story. Um, I mean, it's hard to believe someone transporting a fish of that size. And yeah. I mean, just all of the story, but there are a lot of things that blow, that blow my mind, you know? I mean, I'm fishing a retention pond yesterday in the Chicago suburbs and I catch a small mouth out of it. I mean, there, there shouldn't be a small mouth in that retention pond, you know? Um, and that's the second one this year. So it's more than one, you know, there's, there's somehow a small little colony in this pond of small mouth. 
Um, so yeah, you know, I, like I said, I just saw that sturgeon and it really got me thinking because we have this giant lake, you know, I, I talked to my friends down South and everything and they're like, Jim, you live in Chicago, you live in Illinois, there's no fishing up there, you know? And, and we have to remind everyone that we have one of the biggest lakes, you know, in, in the world, just sitting next to us. Um, but that being said, the fishing in it is yet to be highlighted as much as I feel like it still can be. I feel like it's growing and getting better, for, especially for a few species. It, it continues to get better, it feels like. Um, but the unknown is really what I love because, you know, they talk about the oceans being like space, but I mean, the Great Lakes too. I'm, how, how much of it has been photographed, videoed, you know, maybe 1%. I mean... There's so much water. Well, and there's stuff we still don't know about the Great Lakes. And I mean, that for sure. And things keep evolving. Um, you know, when I when I started, I would talk to older guys, you know, and get their stories. And they would almost all talk about catching herring. Mm -hmm. And it uh, off, you know, like at North Avenue and places like that. Well, the herring have been long gone from here. But, you know, that the lake just keeps changing and changing and changing and uh, little things pop up. And I mean, now all of it, the last five, 10 years, it's burbot and uh, uh, whitefish, you know, what, why are we all of a sudden catching them? You know, so they're, it just, it's fun. Yeah, it, it feels almost, you know, like you said, it's more than just, I, I mentioned the burbot early, but whitefish as well. Um, it feels like it's almost the trickle down effect, you know, um, first it seemed like the, we, the brown trout have long before they got famous out of the Milwaukee area, you know, up in door County, it was unbelievable. You know, they, they kind of started the tournaments for the brown trout and stuff up there. And, and then it was the smallmouth fishing was unmatched up there. Well, it seems like then trickled down, smallie fishing, brown trout fishing got good in the Milwaukee area. Then Waukegan, and even, you know, we see the browns and we see good smallmouth now downtown. You you can catch a 20-pound tournament bag of smallmouth downtown now on the right day. And I just wonder, you know, now seeing the whitefish, now seeing the burbot, you know, I wonder how long it is until we say we start seeing like those Green Bay musky, you know, just giant strain musky down the whole line. Because I think at some point it'll happen because although it's not ideal for them to live, I know they like the shallower, calmer water in the bay. They're apex predators and they're only if they keep breeding successfully, they're only going to have so much room and they're going to keep branching out to find their own area. Yeah, and there are other places that muskie can come from too in in this area that mm -hmm. not including people putting them in but sure. uh, we've had I mean the last few years there's for a while there was I was keeping a chart of every report of a muskie uh you know and I was I think I'm up not up to 10 yet but it's getting close to 10 and I I mean there there's some around I mean there's no denying that uh I remember early on when people would tell me that I'd go, you might want to go and look what a northern pike looks like because we do have them. And by the way, they're that's maybe one of the the great coming fisheries in on on our lakefront is uh, just with the wheat growth in the harbors and near shore that it's kind of ideal for them. They're yeah, I spent, um, you know, I spent uh, a few days the uh, last month fishing Burnham Harbor behind Soldier Field. And I do believe I saw one muskie. I do believe I saw one. Um, you know, just it, it would have to have been such a healthy pike. You know, it would have had to have been truly such a big and healthy pike. Of course, it's like a Bigfoot story. You don't get to see a really clear image of it. You know, you don't get to get a picture of it. It's, it's swimming under a dock and it's gone before you even have any proof of it. But that being said, in those couple days last month that I fished that harbor, I also probably counted over a dozen pike. Yeah, I that that I absolutely believe that. There's a, it's it's remarkable. I mean, the the fun part of muskie is that every muskie guy 
has their opinion of muskies. And so if you run a, if you actually get a photo of one, you know, especially in the water, because it's a little tough to tell, they're all going to have an opinion of what it is, whether it's a pike, a muskie or a tiger muskie. And so it's entertaining when there's those things pop up. Oh yeah. And in my opinion, besides maybe some of the trout out there, there's not much prettier of a fish than a tiger muskie. They are very pretty. I like, I like pike too. I mean, I, I think pike are I just, I, it's the coloration is I find interesting. So Yeah. Yeah. Now where, you know, like you said, the muskie can come from other places and the pike can, where is there, you know, consensus or thought of where the toothy critters are coming from? Cause we haven't even touched about this one, but there's been some walleye caught too. I mean, there's been a little bit of everything caught the last few years. Yeah, uh, the pike, uh, I think, have been around. It's just a thing that conditions, especially with uh, because they're site feeders, the clearer water has helped them, uh, with Zebra. also helped the smallmouth. So uh, yeah. uh, that has helped uh, the, the walleye. I mean, now that's a curious thing because they're, I, my theory is that we have two possibilities for that. We have some resident walleye, and there are also migrant or, or roving bands of walleye in Lake Michigan, come from places like St. Joseph, uh, uh, what's a uh, Galeen River over in, in uh, New Buffalo. Yeah. I mean, they all have, Galeen has some huge uh, uh, walleye come through there, yeah. which they don't like people talking about, and I hope I'm not spilling the beans, but. I mean, that's a lot closer than St. Joe is to our side of the lake. Sure. And and Wolf Lake for years, years ago, the Indiana DNR had stocked tiger muskies. And mm -hmm. the Illinois, uh, there's been muskie in Wolf Lake for quite a while. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, those walleye. Um, it's always been it's always been intriguing to me because. If you go almost anywhere up north, you know, whether it's Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, even in the chain of lakes here in Illinois, it seems like if you can find perch, you can sometimes find walleye right behind them, you know, or nearby. They, they you know, they're a lot alike. Um, they taste alike. Um, but it seems like they kind of move through the same areas at different times or follow each other or the walleye will follow the perch, you know, to eat them. And I've always said, you know, when the weather gets cold, it's perfect walleye time. And you'd think when the perch move in, you'd think there'd be some more things following them. But what we learned for sure, what's following them the last couple of years is the Lakers. They definitely come in and really gouge on them. But, you know, when you see those walleye turn up, is it, is it, is there a rhyme or reason? Is it usually around the same time of year or is it kind of sporadic? I don't think it's rhyme or reason for the fish movement. I think there's more of a rhyme or reason for anglers are, are trolling for salmon or working fall salmon. I've noticed there's the walleye tend to pop up more in the fall when the guys are in close or uh, are in closer, you know, as the Kings and the coho are coming back towards the harbor. I, if I had, one guess I would say that those are related that you just have more anglers in the right area at the right time. Whereas when they're this time of the year and later in the summer, when they're kind of out deeper trolling, I don't think they have as much of an opportunity to run in into a walleye. Uh, but, you know, it's just, it's still, it's still interesting when they pop up. Sure. Although I, I think we have, have or had a resident population in the port of Indiana, but that's been closed since 9-11. Uh, I was very fortunate. I got one to probably within 15 foot of the boat out with the McLurch boys back when they were still going. And this was right before 9-11. So what, 99 or 2000, uh, a winter night. And I, you could clearly see the spot on the tail and you knew what it was. And I thought I finally got a Lake Michigan walleye and it came on hinge before I got it in. Ah. <laughs> so, and then they shut it down and that's, that's by far the best place to fish for them uh, that you might have a legitimate shot. 
I'll tell you what, there wasn't many caught, but um, when I was a kid, you know, my family had a place up in Michigan City and they would like it would seem like one or two reports would come from December to February. But each time someone caught one, it was like eight to 12 pounds. It was like a Lake Erie beast. And see, and that's I think there are two possibilities there. There is. Michigan City might have a resident population too, because they have the creek there that they can move into, and the harbor and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and they're also relatively close to the Galeen River, which has notoriously big fish in it. So I mean, there there's many reasons why there's a, a good walleye there. That that would probably be the best legal spot to to deliberately target them. I would think in that Michigan City area. Yeah, we've tried a few times. No success. <laughs> I I was out with Mike Norris. We spent at least two times that we went out. And I mean, we were, he was deliberately looking for uh, a certain type of uh, structure um, on the reef. And because he thought they should be on the reef, you know, it, it would be a spot that they should be. We just never did anything. So. Yeah, you know, I, um, it's been monumentally helpful in the laker fishing and in the perch fishing, but I really think it's a matter of time um, with the live imaging and the advancements in technology, you know, before we find some of this stuff. I mean, the thing is, there's not a whole lot of people doing it, you know. Our bass fishermen have gone up in the last few years and our perch fisherman numbers I feel like have gotten better again as the as the population of perch has gotten better but there's not too many adventure seekers I see out there trying to find new things so it's almost like someone's got to stumble upon it you know yeah no oh, you you might have a point there that's it's it, it I think there's not a concentrated enough population so that if you're doing it, you're literally trying to find a, a needle in a haystack to use the old saw. But uh, uh, yeah, I to me, I, I enjoy those kind of uh, quests, you know, where it's not guaranteed anything, but it, you're out there and you're trying. So. so that being said, we've talked about it all. What what has been, I guess, the most shocking, the the most fun? Um, you know, what's something that in your 30 years that you've been doing this, you said, wow, I can't believe I'm witnessing this. In fishing or in just in general? You can give me one of each. Okay. Well, in general, I think it's got to be uh, uh, armadillos arriving. Because when I started, you would get a report. I'd call the biologists, say, hey. And their theory at that point was that it was kids coming back from college and um, – you know, like Southeast Missouri State or whatever, yeah. and or from Arkansas, and just bringing them back. And as soon as they crossed over at St. Louis, they would run down a road somewhere and, and dump this uh, arm, dead armadillo on the highway, and then it would get reported. Well, no, it, as it turns out, apparently they, the armadillos were coming across the bridges and stuff because they're here. And, I mean, they're steadily coming north. I mean, I forget how far north they are. I haven't looked here in the last year or so. But, I mean, they literally, they have, I uh, forget who the biologist now is that's tracking them. But she she was doing a, a county by county map as they came up north. So, I mean, that's, to me, that's just fascinating. Uh, the other one is alligator gar being re, uh, because they were gone, completely gone from Illinois. Yeah. Uh, and they've been reintroduced. Uh, what was it, 2010? I think I'm doing that off the top of my head. I might be off by a year. <laughs> and they and they're coming around. Uh, uh, but they take a long time. We're not talking to 200 pounders yet, but uh, yeah. they're yeah. big, big fish. The other thing that's notable with the alligator gar because of climate change, historically the range didn't come much past southern Illinois. Well, they've been stocking them up in central Illinois and uh, uh, even heading in towards northern Illinois. And so, it, you know, as we were saying earlier, things things change and evolve. So. Hey, and on Lake Michigan, um, I mean, the smallmouth was probably the most 
when I started, it was, you know, you would hear rumors of people getting small mouth. People have been getting them out there for a while, but, uh, and then, but you know, to have enough to bring the Bassmasters here in 2000, I don't know how old you were then, but, uh, uh, I don't, do you remember it at all? Or? You know, the sad, the sad reality is that at that time I wasn't into tournament fishing at all. I was into the outdoor stuff, yeah. but I, I vaguely remember watching the news like that, let's say Sunday night saying yeah. bass masters were here this weekend. Um, so I did not see any of it. Uh, I know Wu Dave's one, you know, I'm a historian of bass. Um, I would have loved it. I, you know, they talk about how they'll never come back to Illinois again. If you talk to some people that are internally over at bass, which, which really kills me. Right. Because it's like, this is what they're looking at. They, they started fishing. They fished 2000 Lake Michigan. Okay. Big whoops there. Look at the weights. You can tell they, it, it doesn't even look like Lake Michigan. If you look at the weights nowadays. And then the last time they were here, they put the all-star event on Lake Shelbyville and, and some other goofy lake. And it's like, okay, well, Hey, if you come to some of our better bodies of water, you know, you'd be love, you'd happy. I know, um, during that all-star weekend, you know, I was a marshal for that. And, Brandon Polinick didn't make it to the finals, so he didn't fish. Um, I'm trying to think of what the – Lake Decatur. That's where the finals oh, were, Lake Decatur. Okay. Lake Decatur, really? Yes. I didn't and, remember that. Okay. And this is, this is uh, I would say, in 2013 probably. Sounds, uh, that sounds right. Yeah. And – Instead of going to Decatur, he, I, I believe what they did was took out some veterans or something like that um, on a different body of water. And they fished Lake Clinton, which is one of oh, my yeah. one of my favorite lakes. And Brandon Polinick was like, that lake is awesome. <laughs> and I said, it's great. Yeah, we have, you know, I've got three or four lakes that I would put it on. It's just not we don't have the size for a hundred anglers in our inland lakes, you know. Um, Lake Michigan, I mean, yeah, Lake Michigan's about it. I mean, I to me, if if you're doing it for strictly fishing, I would think Newton, uh, yes. Lake of Egypt, yes. those would come to mind. But I don't know that they could handle a, a full field. So Dale, what's real quick, you know, every every week we try to get a fishing report from someone in the okay. Midwest. What's what's going on right now in, in Illinois in the Chicagoland area? What do you got for me? Well, the one thing to I want to start with Lake Michigan because it looks like we're having a historic year for uh, coho. Hey Dale, one second, one second. Are you touching like by? Oh, your... I'm sorry, I'm touching a wire. Thank you. Yep, yep. I'm it's. I, it, I could be doing this, but uh, it, it might have disrupted something earlier too. I'll have to go back and look. Okay, this, but <laughs> I yeah. hope not. Sorry about that. Yeah, yell at me. Uh, yell at me when when I do that stuff. I got gotcha. you. Sometimes forget. Keep I'll, my I'll hands start, on my I'll laptop. start it back. I'll start it back on okay. the top. <clears throat> so Dale, every week we try to get a fishing report in the Midwest. Um, you've been taking fishing reports and delivering them for years and years. So what do we got on the docket? What's popping right now in the area? Well, I would like to start with uh, Lake Michigan because. It looks like we're headed down for a historic year for uh, coho, both in size and just it's been the fish that's literally been carrying uh, the fishery for uh, most of this year. I mean, the, the coho fishing was so good, they really didn't start chasing lakers, which are kind of the, the shore bet fish until the last few weeks. I mean, the coho are just, I mean, it's just good. Uh, I mean, they're right now they're talking eight to 12 pounds. There was a 17 pounder weight in Waukegan a week ago. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, which, I mean, that's only three pounds off the, the state record that stood for 40 some years. And that, if you're talking about that fish now, that fish in September is a state record, I think. I would hope so. Yeah. 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 And so I think a couple of years ago, I thought they might have a possibility of, of making a, of reaching the state record with uh, with both kings and and coho more with coho than kings, but uh, I think our king record is going to be awfully hard to beat. I just don't think there's enough food there for 
the yeah. big kings to get huge. Uh, but the coho, who eat, eat more of a mixed diet, uh, they definitely, uh, they might, we might have a shot this year. Yeah. And yeah. That, that would be the, the Lake Michigan one that I find intriguing. Uh, inland, it's, there's multiple things. I mean, it's been a pretty good catfish year. I think uh, partly probably just a catfisher there. And I mean, that if, if you want catfish, the one that I think is gaining a lot more interest is flatheads. Yeah. Uh, and part of it is people have, one, learned to catch them and have the right gear to actually handle them if you, because 20 pound fish, even a, which isn't a very big flathead per se, mm -hmm. is is a brute of a fish. I mean, then if you don't have the right gear, Snap. you're not going to handle it. I mean, yeah. it's going to handle you and pretty handily. Uh, so I think people are getting a lot smarter. They're learning how they, how to go after them. Uh, and they're also learning how many we have, how many opportunities we have in this area, What, how many bodies of water have big flatheads. So, Yeah, there's been a, a couple, you know, younger people on social yeah. media, especially that have really opened my eyes to the Fox River flatheads, you know. Yeah. Um, I've known they've been there. Um, I've seen pictures of people catching big ones under dams. I've seen them up, you know, in the Wisconsin stretches of the Fox. But there's truly hundreds of miles of Illinois River where you have a chance of catching a 50-pound flathead. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, legitimately, that's it's not, not hard. Yeah. Speaking of one of the flatheads, that's probably one of the wildest things I've done in my almost 30 years. And that was hogging for flatheads on Wren Lake. A little noodling? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, you should do it once in your life. And that's only yeah. if you're really crazy, do it twice. But uh, no, listen, I've been, I've been reaching out to people. Oh, so have if you've you? got a connection for me, let me know because I, I want to do this year, even I would do a podcast in the water. I want to get down there. I want to get bit. I want to bleed. I want. Uh, I want it. I want the action. The the funny thing is the flatheads are not tar hard one because if you get their jaw, they calm down their lower jaw. The problem with the channels is they're not nearly as big, but they have those little teeth, and you that you feel them bite on your hand, and I, no matter how your head says, don't pull your hand your instinct is to yank your hand and then you just get raked and your blood's coming out and you're in this dirty water, you know, it's just a, a and you go back, don't move your hand. Well, you move it again the next time. So yeah, yeah I'll, I, I'll, hook you, I'll try to hook you up that you would enjoy that. I would. make a good show too. Oh, for sure. I, um, I was bass fishing, you know, and once you start breaking out the crankbaits in the summer, you always got a chance of running into one of those kitties. And I caught, I caught a pretty good channel like a month ago. It was like, I don't know, 12, 13 pounds, you know, pretty good one. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I'm like, I'm just going to grab this thing by the mouth. Like, I know they have little teeth, but it's whatever. The, the force of its bite just took like, it, sh it, it just took me off guard so hard. And um, yeah, it hurt. It hurt. It does not feel good. Um, to get bit by those. Um, so I give even more credit to, you know, um, I think noodling, obviously hillbilly hand fishing, the TV show came out like 10, 15 years ago. And that was the first kind of national recognition of it. Um, but now, but now there's so many social media influencers that are doing it. And a lot of our young ladies down in Alabama and Mississippi doing it. And, you know, I look at this five foot, 200 pound girl grabbing this 60 pound fish. And I'm like, all right, Jim, shake off the pain. It can't be that bad. Oh, you should. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dale, before we go, um, where, you know, if anyone wants to see your writings or what you're doing or the reports you give, how do people check that out today? Sure. If you're old enough to enjoy looking at a newspaper, it's Wednesdays and Sundays. Sundays, I have a two-page spread. Uh, usually, that's more of a think piece. Uh, and then online, I'm on constantly, and that's uh, chicago.suntimes.com slash outdoors. 
Well, hey, Dale, um, you know, I know I'm speaking for a lot of people more than myself, but I want to thank you for all you've done for the industry. And, you know, you guys are the pioneers. If it wasn't for the writers about the industry, there sure as heck wouldn't be TV and podcasters doing it, you know. All right, everyone. And that was Dale Bowman. It was great to catch up to him. And I hope you found some of those unique fish showing up on the lakefront, maybe something that you want to go capture or a reason why to come to Chicago because as I've been saying, Chicago is a fishing city. Now sit tight, we're gonna take a quick commercial break but we're gonna be right back and we're gonna talk to Terry Adams, the crappie slayer of Kentucky Lake. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors giving you the best information on where to go, what to use and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. Alrighty, everyone. Hey, we are joined now with one of the most winning anglers on the crappie tour as of recent, Terry Adams, bait pop pro and crappie touring pro, Terry Adams. What's going on, Terry? How are you? Not much. How are you doing? You know, I'm doing good, man. Um, just had the, a good 4th of July, of course and um feeling patriotic and nothing's more patriotic than doing a little fishing especially doing a little catching and that's uh, right you know i said i need to call terry because i've gotten really into catching crappie the last few years i really have you know it, it's become a quite a joy of mine um especially through the ice but when it comes to the heat of the summer it, it gets a little harder to catch those fish for me so i said i'm going to call my buddy terry and I'm a, I'm a, we're going to figure out how to catch some summer crappie. So how do you feel about talking some crappie today? Yeah, I think I can help you out there. I think I can point you in the right direction. Awesome. All right. So, hey, Terry, for people who have never met you or seen any of your stuff online, um, give the people a little insight on what you've been doing and those big shiny cups behind you. Yeah, um, well, uh, I just started tournament fishing probably about three years ago. And uh, actually, I started tournament fishing out of my granddad's 1989 16-foot bomber. Is my first year of, of tournament fishing was out of that, and yep. was fortunate to to win win a few tournaments and do well. And then I went to a little bit bigger boat now, and uh, and I've had just a little bit of success out of it, and uh, just really having a lot of fun tournament fishing. That's awesome. Now, when it comes to tournament fishing and crappie fishing, I'm I'm a little ignorant to how that all happens, you know. Um, I know in bass, most people I think know bass fishing, your best five, right? At the end of the day, mm -hmm. counts. Um, so in crappie tournament fishing, how do you win or what's what's the limits there? Or how does that work? So when I first started tournament fishing, it was always seven. It was always your your best seven, and then you would get big fish of the tournament too. And then this year, some of the trails have stuck with that and a few others have went to five now. So now it's five. So it kind of changes the strategy a little bit. You're, you're no longer looking, you know, for your, the, the average seven, you're trying to find that, that kicker fish is critical now on, on five. You have to have your kicker fish. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It seems like, you know, when you're only fishing for five bites, it's, it's easier to catch bigger fish, but when you need a larger limit, you know, you can't necessarily look for those individual unicorns, you know? Yes. Yep. And usually in my mind, I'm thinking I want one bite per hour. If I can get one really good bite per hour, and if I do that, it kind of takes the pressure, especially if I can get them early. If I can get two or three really early, it takes all the pressure off. Um, but I kind of, I'm, I'm a big fan of the five fish. I think it's a little bit, I don't know, just, it's a different mindset, but I, I really enjoy it. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it sounds like they might be taking a little bit of a piece from the Bass guys, you know, the five trying to make it a little more competitive, maybe some tighter weights too when you go to five. Yeah. I will say that too because all the all the weights have really have really tightened up. And on a seven fish, if you catch a, a big bag on day one, you can you can be up two two and a half three pounds even, and you've got a good cushion. But now you catch a really good bag and you're up one pound, and you know that's just one bite. So yeah. it, it really makes it really competitive. Yeah, and um, are most of these events one, two, three days? How, what's that usually like? Uh, typically, they're two days, two day events. Yeah. Okay. And where all do you fish? Do you, do you get to travel all over the country? Do you come up in the Northern part of the Midwest? Is it all kind of in the central South Midwest or? Yeah, kind of in, in more of the South. I've, I've been fortunate this year. I'm trying to expand and, and fish a lot more of these lakes. I really enjoy trying to, trying to figure them out is a lot of fun. And I, I've been to a wise Lake, Alabama. I got to fish a tournament there this year in old Hickory Lake uh, in Nashville. I got to fish there for a tournament and it just, great fisheries and i just really enjoy trying to trying to unlock them and figure out where those big fish live at yeah and i think that's what we all want to do right is is take what we learn from one body of water or our home body of water and then try to replicate that in other places however it's not always doable <laughs> no no it's it's very humbling and just like for example old hickory I, I went down there for two days and kind of pre-fished before the tournament and I caught some really good, there, there's some big crappie in that lake. And I went there tournament morning, no one was around. I had the whole place to myself. I'm like, okay, I'm in good shape. And it was a ghost town. There was no crappie there at all. So I had to just throw that out the window and just go fishing and, uh, and try to figure it out. But it's just, that, that is part of the fun of it too, though. Yeah. Now, is it like, is it like tournament bass fishing where there's no live bait allowed or are you allowed to use live bait? Uh, yeah, we we can use live bait. We're we can use bait. live bait. All right. Yeah. And are there anything off limits? Are because I know there's a lot of ways I've caught crappie. You know, whether it's trolling or slip bobbering or live bait. So, is there anything off limits there? I, I think there's like a hook limit. I think so. You can only use so many hooks per line and stuff. Mm -hmm. But majority of the ones that are tournament fishing are one pole live scoping for the most part. So yeah. it kind of that kind of eliminates that. Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, it's been a topic all year long, last year too, yeah. the, the live scope, right? Whether you love it or hate it, it is it is very influential and it is changing the game. It, it's totally, and especially for crappie, especially I think because growing up, I, I started crappie fishing when I was like four years old with my granddad and my dad and they, they'd have me out there all the time. And it was always spider rig. And that, that's what we did until, you know, live scope came along and, and my boat was rigged for spider rig. And as soon as I went out in just a few weeks, took all that, threw it off. And I'm like, okay, I'm one pole now. And I, it just changed the entire way I've ever fished, but it, it is so much fun. Once you do it, it's just, it, it's really a lot of fun. Absolutely. And I have to give you credit, you know, if you're chasing those live scoping, because I, I do agree with you, like you said, especially on crappie when it comes to live scope, because um, I see it a lot during the ice season, but I've seen it open water too. I mean, there really isn't a fish, in my opinion, um, especially in this part of the U.S., that schools up like a crappie. You know, just, yep. these other freshwater fish just do not do what they do. Right. Yeah. That, and that's what, like, like this time of year in the summertime, for example, they can really get congregated together. And you can catch a limit pretty quick. That's what usually it's so hot right now. I try to get off the water, you know, three or four hours and all the all the boats come out then too. There's a lot of a lot of traffic. But you can get on the right spot and, and it's 20, the limit's 20 here, and you can catch that pretty quick. Yeah, no doubt. And I you know, we've heard from our northern Wisconsin friends about some of their concerns, you know, on how some of the meat hunters out there can kind of find these schools, especially in the fall, winter, you know, where they don't move a whole lot generally. Mm -hmm. um, and they just day after day, you know, they're following the limit rules, right? Right. Yep. But if they go home and feed their family, you know, the possession limits out of it's out already. So they can go out there every day and be catching, you know, five to 10 or so every day. And I mean, for giant body of water, maybe that's not a big deal, but for a smaller body of water, especially if you're on those big fish, I mean, that can be pretty detrimental pretty quickly. 
it could. And I don't think like Kentucky Lake where is my home lake, Kentucky and Barkley. It's just such a large body of water. We're not seeing any impact from it there. And I, and I do think there's an angler responsibility as well. And uh, most of the ones like I tournament fish, I, I'm good friends with all these guys. And most of us, we we catch when we want to eat. But other than that, the days of stocking your freezer up with a thousand packs of crappie are done. Really, I think it kind of anytime we want, we can go out there, you know, and, and catch enough to feed the family. So, yeah, being being smart, not being gluttonous, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, speaking of your home lake, you said Kentucky Lake. Now that is one of the first lakes I really got an introduction to big crappie, right? Um, they got them both, I believe white and black crappie down there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And, um, you know, the way I fished them were really cool. Um, you know, the lake was up like 11 feet high and all them fish, we were pretty much just dipping, you know, into trees and, <laughs> and it was so much fun. Now, I I am curious on the topic before we move on from um, live scope and live imaging is are people certain times a year still able to win that way fishing off of knowledge and not the screen? I, I do. I think you it can be done, but more often than not, it probably won't be done. But I, I do think if you just happen to get on that right spot, you know, and, and catch those, get those right five bites, you could, you could beat anybody. So it, it definitely could happen. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest thing that I've seen is how many fish would normally never be fished for, right? Like, um, I think you saw this, I don't know if you watch any of the Bassmaster stuff, but we just talked about um, the, the Bassmaster event on Smith Lake. It's a very clear, very deep water impoundment in Alabama. And there's these bass guys fishing in over 70, over 80, over 90 feet of water, but <laughs> catching the fish in 10, 15, 20. But those, no one would have ever looked for those. Maybe some people, locals knew that and so on. But Proppy, I've realized that in just a lake by us. You know, we have a power plant lake here that uh, is heated and it's super deep, right? They, they quarried it out for the nuclear plant. It's got 80 foot drops and all these things. And I've never in years, I've been fishing for 15 years. I've never once caught a crappie there. I go out there for the first time ever last spring with live scope. And we find these balls just in the middle of the lake. And we're saying, hey, are they crappie? Are they bluegill? Are they shad? We don't know. We cast into them and start catching crappie. Now they weren't giant, but again, yeah. I have never even caught a crappie out there. And then within the first 20 minutes, I caught one looking for them, you know? Yeah, that, that's kind of what, what live scope has done is it just, you can look at areas that you never would have went before ever. And now, like you say, they're up in the water column, but it might be a hundred foot deep and it, it's amazing. And it, it always makes me think in like places that I would drive right past and I would go over here and I'm like, well, maybe I need to check that out. And with, with live sonar, you can kind of figure it out pretty quick what's going on there, which, which I really enjoy. Absolutely. Now I don't, I don't need any of your super secrets. All right. I'm sure there's still some events for the year that you got, yeah. but I am curious, obviously the gear in the bass world has started to change like what people are buying and stuff. I found out that this year, I think they talked about this on the Tackle podcast or the Serious Angler podcast. Um, for the first time in over like 10 years, there's more spinning reels being bought than bait casting reels for the bass stuff. And I think a lot of that has to do with sniping, you know, looking on the graph and yep. casting at the fish. So I am curious, what is your go-to gear uh, equipment, rod and reel, bait, you know, line, whatever, that you're using now and has it drastically changed it, it has a lot and, and my favorite i always use a 10 to 13 foot rod and i do have a casting pole as well and i'm a big floral floor carbon and i use canine uh, floor carbon i've used them for three years ever since i started tournament fishing and it's just good strong line and uh, I kind of do a combo of a bait caster for most of it. I use a bait caster, but I also have the open face reel too. And it's just like you say, just trying to get on those fish as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Um, 
how do you manage spooking the fish? Because that's what I've seen when you see those crappie, especially when they're higher in the water column, they, there might not be a more finicky fish also than the crappie. So this right here, I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure that out, like probably too much time. But so I've got a good friend of mine, uh, Danny Rogers, down in Camden, Tennessee. He owns Performance Fish and Lake Trunk. So he put brakes on my boat like two years ago. It was the first brakes. I got the prototype brakes. I've used them for two years now. Lo I don't think I could fish without them. I love these things. And so and he just put a quest on, too. So I've just had it for like a week. Super excited about that. I think I'm going to be quieter, quicker and quieter getting to these fish. And then when I get there, I use my brakes on the back, stop, and then I can catch them. So that right there, that's been a, a huge key to any of my success has been that that combo. So I didn't, we didn't plan on talking about this, but we got to stop the pod <laughs> here and talk about it because I know what you're talking about, but I don't think most people do that are listening because you just said brakes on a boat. And last time I checked, there's no wheels to put brake back <laughs> on a boat. So how exactly are there brakes on a boat, Terry? So what I've got on mine, I've got two 30-pound uh, thrust trolling motors on the, on the back of my boat, on, uh, and they're mounted to my power poles. With it. Like I say, Danny down there, he's got his own setup, and uh, he put it on there. And so what I do is whenever I get to my spot, I, I put my power poles down in the water. And uh, and then I'm just going usually wide open. I'm going as fast as I can, just trying to cover water. And as soon as I find that fish out there, I've got a button there, a little stomp switch, and I'll put my foot on it, and it just stops, stops the boat right there. And it's great for boat control too. So if I kind of make, you know, I go left, I should have went right. I can back up and then turn and get on that fish. It's just it, it's such an advantage to have that that technology. Now, have you? Have you, let me ask you this, have you got the tracing technology yet that makes you follow a fish that you tag? No, no, not yet. <laughs> I haven't. That'll probably be next for me, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To the people at home, that is the newest software that they're working on that you can link these breaks with your fish finder. And if you see a school of fish or even an individual fish, you can kind of pin it on the graph and it will your boat will follow that fish as long as it <laughs> contact with it, which I don't know. You know, I think, you know, I think for the tournament anglers, when it's your job, right? When it's your job, everyone gets the best tools, right? If you're a construction mm -hmm. worker, you're going to get the safest and best performing tool you can to do your job efficiently and successfully at the highest level. Right. And, That's you know, right. I hear the word cheating a lot, right? It's not cheating. It'd be in a rule book if it was cheating. Um, but that being said, these are not things that the average fisherman or the weekend fisherman needs or should even, I shouldn't say shouldn't have, you know, anyone should and can have anything they want, right? You work hard in this life, go get to what you want. Right. But in my opinion, the term fishing, it you are surpassing it with all this stuff now, you know? It is it is tournament level, it is professional level fishing. Um, once you have all that kind of stuff. It is, it really is. And the thing to to stay competitive, because these guys are so good, you have you almost have to get that stuff just to keep up with them. And uh, but but the thing is for me is once I get it and I get used to it, it's hard to go back once you have it like before you get it you don't really think about it that much once you get it, it is very nice having it, having it on there i don't know what would i don't know who's louder the people who um are complaining about live scope aka the people who just don't have it or can't afford it pretty much um or the people who are in the or live by it if they ever decide to ban it one day i don't know whose screams would be louder yeah <laughs> i don't know i don't know I, I, I still think I could go back and still catch them, but it, it would be an adjustment just because I've gotten so used to to fishing this way now, and, and I just really enjoy it. And uh, just finding those bigger fish, it, it's just so much fun for me. Absolutely. So let's let's take it to your, to the home lake. Let's take it to Kentucky Lake. You know, mm -hmm. um, here we are, July. Um, how how would you approach or how would you suggest a a newcomer to Kentucky Lake? um looks for those fish this time of year right now so right now it used to you would fish the spawn here 
and you're done. You're, you're done to the fall. But now that's the, again, where technology comes in, we can fish these things year round now. So and that makes it a lot of fun. But um, so our spawn usually ends about the mid, mid of May is the spawns over and these fish start kind of migrating out, out of these shallow areas. And uh, so the, the first two weeks after they spawn, they're tough. They're very tough to catch these fish. And then now it's been about a month and a half and they, they start getting kind of predictable. You can kind of figure out where they're at and they're they're feeding up again. And it is so much fun getting out there. I'll take the family out there and we'll just go out there and catch them. And if you can you can get that bait near them, a lot of times you're, you're going to catch them. So, yeah. And you said earlier, you know, once it starts getting hot, like it, they do when it gets real cold, they're, they're schooling up now post-spawn. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. And, and that, that's what would be my advice is when you get out there, just look until you find, and I would start probably in 10 foot of water and go out, they go all the way to 30 foot. And, but once you find them, you know, you're going to find them pretty quick probably. And they're probably going to be schooled up and you're going to catch a bunch of them. Yeah. Yeah. So generally speaking, you find them kind of off the bank, but before the river swing, kind of somewhere in between that. Yeah. I don't, I don't think a lot of the ones I find don't go super far. You know, you come out of those spawning areas and you go out and you start looking out deeper and you're, you're going to find them out there. I don't think they go just super far. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so obviously we got some beautiful hardware next to you, you know, um, what have you been up to this year? What what have we won, and uh, what do you got left this season? Well, uh, so I, I was super fortunate. I got to, to fish with my dad, and in 2022 we won the classic, and uh, it was actually here on our home lake, and uh, that was his last tournament. He said he wanted to go out on top, so th then I went out. Now I fish by myself, which most of the people I compete against they're a team. It's usually it's two people, and so for me, I have to be super efficient with what I do, which comes back to the products I use. It's a you know, huge benefit for me. Um, but I was fortunate in September, I won a, a super event here. Um, and then I won a, a local classic in December. Um, and then in May, they had a mega bucks here. And I was super fortunate to win, to win the mega bucks. I actually uh, caught, I had my biggest fish I've ever caught. It was a 3.34 crappie. I won big fish on it. And uh, my average was over two and a quarter for for the tournament so it was it just it, it hit perfect right there in the spawn and it, it was just it was one of my favorite fishing memories i've had and then um then i ended up fishing a uh, ncl tournament here uh, a national and I, and I won it a couple weeks ago and so now i've got a little time off i'm just kind of just fun fishing for a change and no pressure and I, i'm really just enjoying getting back out there and trying out some new products and uh, and then we've got the classic comes back to Kentucky Barkley Lake in October. So I'm hoping maybe I can get my my second one of those. That's what I'm gearing up for. Absolutely, it never hurts. It never hurts to have the big events on the home body of water, right? <laughs> it, I, it it's a little pressure, you know, going into it. And you kind of the only thing I try to do is keep an open mind because you kind of want to go off history of what you've done before. But out of the tournaments I've won, I don't think any of them I've won in the same area. The I kind of, yeah, it's always a different spot where I'll find these bigger fish. And I, so I always just try to keep an open mind. But yeah, there, there's no place like home, though. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Terry, I there is one thing, and um, you know, this is this is no sponsor plug for us at that show. Um, but I've seen one thing in the last two years. I've seen you winning on the crappie side nonstop, and I see Jacob Wheeler winning on the bass side nonstop. And there is one thing that you guys have in common, and that's a little tube. That's right bait pop and it, it, it's kind of funny actually before I, I even got to know them and, and they are great the owners of that company are just great people and before i got to know them it was before the classic in 2022 and i i called and i got a tube of it and i was like i'm just going to try this pro i've got to know what it's about and i tried it and actually and i won the classic and i, I was using it and then I got to meet them and talking to them. And I've, I've just, I've had the pleasure of getting to use this product for two years now. And it, it is just, it's a great product and it, it holds that scent. It's got the original for, fish formula scent in it. And you don't have to put it on a hundred times a day. You can put it on there and fish for 30 minutes and smell it. It's still got it on there. It, it's just, it, it's a really great product. And I'll show you, I've actually got a tube that I, I used. The, the one I did my best, and you can see that, is the crawfish. Okay. And uh, what I won the mega bucks with it, and 
it, it has been, it's kind of like a reddish color and it is really, I, I feel like in my mind, there's, there's crappie out there that they're going to eat anything. You can, you can put that bait bomb and they're going to eat. And you've got crappie out there. They're not going to eat anything. You, no matter what you do, yeah. but I'm going after those fish that are on the fence. They're, they might eat or they might not. And when they come up there and they'll nose it, nose it, nose it. And I feel like that's where that product comes in because they nose it and then they'll nip at it. And that's usually all it takes. And you can set the hook. And especially in tournament fishing, you know, one bite, that, that's the difference in winning and losing. So it, it is a great tool to have on the boat for sure. Absolutely. And to be fair, I I find the other half of the component of the, the product to be more fascinating than the scent side. Um, obviously, I understand that it makes fish like it more, but for the human side, you actually get to see your bait better, right? It amplifies. It, it, does. it does. And they've actually, they've got videos of that and they'll put it on the line, not even on the, on the hook. And you'll see the return on live sonar of that product, which is pretty remarkable, really. Um, uh, and uh, and I've actually I've got a couple of videos. I was just having fun and, and put it on a bare hook and just put it down there and caught a fish, you know, in about like 20 seconds. So that, they really the fish like it. And I've had a lot of fun uh, getting to use it. And it, like I say, huge advantage for me and uh, and great people, great, great owners there. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Terry, before we let you go, though, I do I do want to branch into a little bit more of just crappie fishing in the Midwest. Right. Um, because we've got so many places that are different, you know, I mean, there's giant crappie in the backwaters of the Mississippi river. There's big crappie up in Minnetonka and Minnesota, big crappie on Lake of the Ozarks over to you, but, and all these fisheries are so different, you know? So how, like, just give me and, and everyone that's watching some advice, uh, especially we'll focus on summer fishing, you know, I mean, what what should we be looking at when it comes to this? Because I feel like in the summer, you know, panfish, bass, catfish, they all get a little more predictable. They all get a little easier to catch with the warm water. But the crappie seem to almost like the colder water, like the walleye a little more, you know. So, But that being said, both can be caught well in warm water. So what are some of your... Uh, go-to advice for summer fish and crappie here in the Midwest? Mine, like the best advice that I, I can give is just cover water, like cover as much water as you can. And once you kind of, you figure out like, Hey, I caught a couple right here, expand on it. Try to look at your map and be like, okay, I caught them here. What's kind of a similar area and then go look over there and then just keep building the building on it. So that, that would be my advice, but yeah, covered water. That is the name of the game right now. Well, hey, Terry, I want to say thank you for joining us. Um, if anyone wants to check out the socials or see how you're doing in tournament results, where where can they check that stuff out at? So I've got uh, Facebook uh, at Terry Adams and then Instagram, Terry Adams Fishing. And uh, I'm about to start up a YouTube channel. So uh, you can you can find me there on my Instagram and I'll put the link there. And thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. Hey, I promise you next time, how about we get out on the water and we could actually do a uh, we can do a little little show together, you know? I, I would love that. That would be great. Awesome. Well, everyone, this is Bait Pop Pro, Terry Adams out of Kentucky Lake. Terry, thank you once again. And, hey, good luck for the rest of the season, buddy. All right. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but I am so ready to go catch some paper lips right now. Um, I want to thank Terry for joining us. You know, that was very insightful and truly one of the bodies of water that are really, really known for crappie, especially in the Midwest down there in Kentucky Lake. And by the sounds of it, the fishery down there is just getting better and better, whether you're fishing for sauger, crappie, or bass. So it's a beautiful thing to hear about one of my favorite lakes in the country. We're gonna take a quick commercial break, but don't go anywhere because we have a product review you're gonna to wanna to see before we wrap it up. So we'll be right back. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com.
Hey everyone, today we are going over the Lakewood Hanging Swim Bait Box. Now, this has become one of my favorite box because I love throwing swim baits, but also just because of how nice it presents your tackle. Um, you can see your bait really well. It makes it not lay up on any other baits, so you're never gonna have um, any of that plastic melting on other plastic or kinks in your soft swim bait tails. Super important. It holds 24 mid to large size baits or 12 extra large pike and musky style baits. You can see what I was talking about on those soft baits. It keeps them nice and straight so you have a true running tail. And what's easy about this hanging system is you can just pull your bait off, put it right back on, go to a different bait, pull it off, put it right back on. It's got ample storage on the side of them. Keep my tools in here, stuff like that. Replacement tails over here. So it's a great box. It's easy to travel with, it's comfortable. And because it's rigid, tough system, it can even withstand truck or even airplane travel. So that is why it has become one of my favorite boxes. If you guys love throwing swim baits, you love throwing big baits, this is a box for you. You can hang it put it away, forget about it, and the bait will always come out true next time you're ready to use it. So if you guys wanna check out this swim bait box or the larger musky size or any of the Lakewood products, check out lakewoodproducts.com. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. Alrighty, everyone. Well, hey, we did it. We made it to the end of another episode of the Midwest Outdoors podcast brought to you by Fish Daddy. As always, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. It is an absolute pleasure doing this. I want to thank Terry and Dale for joining me this week. It's always fun to have an insight on something new going on and meet someone new and also return to some old memories and talk to someone from our past. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Next show, we will have a recap of what's going on down at ICAST since that's coming up. I hope everyone had a happy and safe 4th of July this past weekend. And hey, we'll see you guys next time. Till then, tight lines. <laughs>